Before I start my talk, I want to ask you something. Uh, for everybody in the audience who's wearing shoes with shoelaces, please untie the shoelace of your right shoe. Please do so. Okay. Well, that was easy. Now I want to ask you to raise your left hand and use your right hand to tie your shoelace. <laughs> Only your right hand. Okay? A little bit quicker, please. Okay, you, you can use both hands now. You can practice it at home. Well, as you noticed, uh, very simple things uh, of daily activities suddenly become a real challenge when you have only one hand available. And this kind of problems, uh, these are the problems that a person who is missing a hand faces every day. Not to speak about people who, who are missing both hands. This is not twice as bad. This is much, much worse. Well, it is my dream to provide those people with an artificial hand, an artificial hand that can help them to perform mo uh, those kind of daily activities just with two hands, like we all do. Well, if you watch television, we get the impression that this problem has already been solved. We see smiling people wearing their brand new hand prosthesis. However, if you go to the rehabilitation clinic, we get a totally different story. Over 30% of the people who are getting their prosthetic hand do not use it. They stop bearing it after some time because they think it's more of a burden to them than of a benefit. Over 30%. I was really shocked when I heard this number. So, are they ungrateful? Why, why do they do it? Or is, is, is this problem more complicated? Well, let's have a look at what's available for, the, for uh, an amputee now. In the first place, we have this hook, the split hook. It was invented in 1912, the year the Titanic sank, the year that uh, the telephone was still in its infancy, only very rich people were to, arrive, to afford themselves a modern T Ford. And, well, things have changed now. Uh, we are 100 years further, and we now have smartphones. We all can drive a car if we want to. But this device, well, it, it still looks the same. And it works very simple. There is a, a strap, this strap. Uh, which is attached to a cord. If you pull it, you can open it. And, well, you can put your hand through the strap, put the strap around your shoulder, and that by increasing the distance between the prosthesis and your shoulder, you can open and close it. It works very well, and the people are very satisfied with it. It is fast, it is very lightweight, it is reliable only it does not really look like a hand. So there's a second option, which is the body-powered hand. It's also body-powered. You can also attach a strap to this hand, put it around your shoulder, and then by pulling the cable, you can operate it. Well, this really looks like a hand. Simple. However, it's not so simple as you might think because opening this hand requires a lot of force. And most people simply are not strong enough to operate this hand. So they do also don't use it. And the problem with this hand is that there's too much friction inside this mechanism. And, well, therefore you have to apply a lot of force. Well, there is a third option. And that is the electric hand. The electric hand has batteries, a motor inside the hand. The motor opens and closes the hand. And there are skin electrodes. And 
Well, the skin electrodes pick up the signal of the remaining muscle in your forearm. And so you can, you can contract those muscles, can send the signal to the prosthesis, and then the hand opens. Well, this really looks like a nice system. Unfortunately, this system also has some drawbacks. One of the problems is that you can send a signal to the prosthesis, but it doesn't send you a signal back. So, without noticing it, you can exert too much force. And you can accidentally squeeze an object. Or, there's another problem. The hand sometimes, the hand is not 100% reliable, which means that from time to time, suddenly, it unexpectedly closes or opens. And that's not so handy when you're holding your cup of coffee. So, and then there is one, one other issue. And, well, I would like to ask somebody in the audience to, uh, to assist me. Perhaps you, you can come up the stage for a moment. Yeah, give me a hand. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I, w I would like to ask you to hold, hold, hold this device and hold this device and tell us what do you feel. This one is more heavy and more light. Yes, yeah. indeed. This device is much, much more heavier. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> you experienced it, but that's the same. What the, what the amputees experience. And as you see, uh, these three options, they all have their drawbacks. Of course, they also have some benefits, but the drawbacks outweigh the benefits, and therefore, many people stop wearing it. So, how can, uh, how is this, can this problem be solved? Well, the current solution is to add more functions to the prosthesis to increase the benefits. For example, the newest electric hand has uh, articulating fingers that can bend around an object. Or they have, and they have uh, different grasping options. Well, that is nice. However, this extra functionality comes at a price. Because we, add, we have to add multiple motors, and the device becomes heavier. Also, because we, uh, also the controlling the prosthesis becomes more complex. So, we get stuck in a vicious circle. The user is dissatisfied, the manufacturer starts to add functions, the burdens increase, uh, and in the, the end, the amputee gets more dissatisfied. Well, when we look uh, at a massive prosthetic uh, device, we can see, on my left side, we see a body power device from 1945. It was developed right after the Second World War. It is still used. And it is 350 grams. Well, at that time already, it was remarked that this hand should be lighter. It was, it was, not, uh, it was too heavy for some of the people. Well, as we can see, the next generation hands is not becoming lighter. And then, when the electric device was invited, the devices became even more, became even heavier, because the motors were added, and the red area on top, that's the battery, which is added. So, we get stuck in this circle. And when I noticed this, I, I was very disappointed, and I asked myself, how, how is this possible? We can send people to the moon, we can send a robot to Mars, and we cannot give people a, a nice artificial hand. So what can we do about this? How can we get out of this vicious circle? Well, I asked the, the people, in the, well, the amputees, and I also read user studies, and, and what they said was, well, we want to have a mass reduction. The, the device should be lighter. So instead of increasing the functions and increasing the burdens, we should be focused on decreasing the burdens for the patient. And the number one design priority is make the device lighter. 
Okay, well then I ask myself a question. Is it really necessary to, use, to provide people with an electric prosthetic hand? Well, we don't do that to people in a wheelchair. If you cannot use your legs, but still your hands are working, then you can propel your own wheelchair. You do not need an electric wheelchair. So why would we do things differently in upper limb prosthetics? If we use a body-powered system, we can get rid of the motors and we can get rid of the batteries, and the device can be much, much more lighter. So let's focus on body-powered devices instead of electric devices. But as I told you, the body-powered hand has a lot of friction inside. And not only in the hand, also in the cable. That's a, the, it's a cable which is similar to your braking cable of your bike, and there's a lot of friction inside it. So isn't it possible to replace this cable and this mechanism by something that has less friction? And in that way, the user needs less effort to, to operate the device. Well, I started looking around in other fields, and I discovered that in airplanes, in the past, they also used rods and cables to operate an airplane, and in cars, they also used rods and cables to operate the car brakes. But today, they don't use it anymore. They use hydraulics. So they use tubes and hoses which connect small cylinders, which which contain fluid, and by those you can control the brakes of your car, for example. And you can distribute a lot of energy and force without friction, or, or with a very low amount of friction. Okay, so hydraulics could be a solution. So I went to the hydraulic shops, and I asked for small cylinders, because I wanted to put small cylinders inside a hand. Well, this is what they gave me. This is our smallest cylinder, they told me. Well, you can imagine that this is never going to fit inside a hand. So, should we, should, yeah, is it possible then to use hydraulics? Well, we decided to use our own, uh, to make our own cylinders. And that's what we did. And this is the result. A hand which has very, very small cylinders. And these tiny cylinders are so small that they fit inside a human finger. So it's amazing. Imagine what we can do with uh, all those kind of cylinders. We can put up multiple cylinders in one hand. We can, can control multiple joints. And it just works the same way as, your bi as the brake of your car. In your car, you push one brake pedal, and suddenly, at the same time, your four wheels brake at the same time, and you can very accurately control the brake force. Well, it works the same way in this hand. You can pull one master cylinder, which is attached to the shoulder strap, and by, that, by doing that, the hand closes, and the hand is designed in a smart way so that it, it adapts to the shape of the object, and you can very accurately control your, the grasp force, as we can see in this movie. You can see that the, shape, that the hand adapts to the shape of the object. It can be a small object, it can be a round object, and you can exert less force without squeezing the cup, or you can exert more force and squeeze the cup, and you can so accurately control the pinch force that you can even hold a pair of tweezers and pick up small objects. And this is absolutely impossible with current prosthesis. But of course, you can also pick heavier objects. You can hold a pencil. Or simply turn pages of a book. Well, we wanted to know how people could work with that. And we asked patients, invited patients, and also I asked healthy people to work with the hand. Well, this man lost his hand in an accident. He, he used to, normally uses a, a body-powered prosthesis. Well, we replaced it 
by this hand, and he was to able to even operate a pair of tweezers. And he, he was very enthusiastic about it, and he, one important remark that he made, he said, it's amazing how, how light it is. And it is very light. And that's also what, what the other people noticed. Well, you can see that he, he uses it without problem. And also, uh, I asked some of my colleagues, they, they just placed a hand beside of their own hand. And from the first minute on, they were able to operate the hand. It is very easy. Everybody in this audience can do it. So, it is very light. And when we compare it to current available hands, we can, we can see, look, have a look at the graph again. It's only 152 grams. <laughs> so, yeah, I was very happy with the results, and uh, people were also very happy. Uh, well, we, we tested it inside uh, here in Delft in the university, and uh, we, we did duration tests with many cycles to see how long it lasted, and it lasted. We, we tested it with several people, with many different people, and, well, the hand passed all tests. So that was inside, inside the university. And that's usually where the story ends, because then there is a nice a photograph in the newspaper, and sometimes on television, and then in 95% of the cases, the hand ends in the closet, and only when the new students come, they will see the hand. But, uh, well, that's not a way I want to end this project. It is my goal and it is my dream to bring this hand outside the university to the patients, so they, they can test it at home, work with it, go to school with it, study with it, and do normal daily things like tying their shoelaces with two hands, like we all do. Thank you. <laughs>